Welcome to Engaging the Supernatural, where we explore what God is saying through signs, wonders, and miracles. I'm excited to sit down today with my good friend, Ivan Tuttle, and we're going to be talking about his journey that started in hell, ends up in heaven, and then God sends him back to earth. I know you're going to get something encouraging and maybe challenging out of this, but we love sharing these encounters that people have had in heaven. Ivan, it's good to see you, my friend. Welcome back to the show once again. Oh, thank you. It's good to be here. <laughs> I think the place I'd love to begin, because I know often in these heaven stories, these encounters, we focus on maybe the time in hell, the time in heaven, but we often don't get enough of the backstory. And so I want to make sure we have the context. Tell us a little bit about your upbringing. Were you in church? Uh, what were some of the things that you had early in life in, in terms of like church encounters, understanding of God? Sure. No problem. Well, as a little kid, one of the things I love doing is going to church. I had a dad, you know, just be, I'll, I'll touch on this briefly. I had a dad that was real abusive, you know, beat me a lot. And so when I could go to church, you know, because my dad didn't go, you know, I couldn't wait to go to church, but I learned something in church in Sunday school. And they would teach you about how much God loves you. He would sing songs. Uh, I was with every, all these other kids and everybody was having fun together. We could all have fun. And so that was my safe place to go to start with. And as I grew older, you know, I start, I just had a relationship with God and with Jesus. It was just unreal. I mean, it was just one I wanted to have. And, and I spent many, many times as a young kid, you know, I got saved at a young age. I went to youth camp. I went to kids camp first and couldn't wait till I could go to youth camp because I heard that was really even better than the kids camp. But we used to every night they'd have the tabernacle thing. You know, we'd meet in this tabernacle, as they call it, and you just spend time in prayer and everything. And by the time I was a teenager, well, before I became a teenager, I was 12. I got filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues. And when that happened, you know, and I get into, I get into youth camp and it's like, ah, oh, well, I'm one of these people that would get into youth camp and then would get into the tabernacle. And after the service, they had a big prayer room in the back and I would get back there and I'd be at, back there just praying for hours and hours. Now they usually try to turn the lights out at like 11 o'clock at night, get everybody back to their dorm or back to their cabin. And I'd still be there. And sometimes I'd fall asleep, my hands raised up, laying on the floor, my arms are propped up, and I'm speaking in tongues, just having a great time with the Lord. And I fall asleep like that. And many times they had to carry me to my room. So I was going through this, and then I just wanted to serve God. I wanted to be a preacher. That's all I wanted to do. So I went through high school, got a chance to go to college. Now, like I said, my dad was like he was, but my dad also had a heart attack at the age of 14, so he couldn't work anymore. So my dad was a bricklayer, but the income finally fell down where there was no income coming in. So I worked at the NCO club over at Andrews Air Force Base, washing dishes, trying to make money, but not enough for me to go to college. But I found out there's this college up in Maine, Brookline, Maine, called Faith School Theology. And I could go there and, and attend their college if I worked on their farm. So I thought that's a good trade-off. I didn't know anything about farming, <laughs> but I did it, you know. And I just couldn't wait, man, because I got a chance to go out there and I learned these things in Bible college. And I was just like, man, on fire for God. I couldn't wait. I actually got to speak in a couple of churches. And, and it was fun. It was a blast. And I just loved serving the Lord. And it was the greatest thing in the world for me. So. Well, and this might be a, a little bit of a left turn from where we're going to go later in the conversation. But I know you have kind of a funny story of early on when you were preaching. And I remember if you were tapping your foot or what it was. But uh, you got some interesting feedback after your message was over. Yeah, thanks. Uh, <laughs> oh, you're welcome. <laughs> I didn't know you could bring that up. <laughs> yes, it was, it was uh, actually up in Maine, and I was in, in Bangor, Maine, and they had this, uh, the, the platform that they had you on was hollow underneath, you know. <laughs> and so I had these leather shoes on, with, and I think I had a tap on the, on, on the heel or something. And every time you hear this plap, 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 because I was <laughs> tapping my foot back and forth. I didn't realize I was nervous. And I was doing that, and this one guy, and everybody was saying, hey, great message. And finally, this one old guy comes up, and he goes, well, you know, hey, that, was a, that was a great message, but um, next time, could you not tap your foot so much? Because <laughs> it kind of overran your message. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, as, as a guy who was a nervous foot tapper early on when I was public speaking, that, that part of your story just stuck out, stuck out to me. So thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, so let's fast forward. You're in Bible college. You're on track to become a preacher. And then all of a sudden, your life takes a turn. How did things shift? Well, this is what happened. Went home for a Christmas break. And just going home was, you know, I, you have to realize when you're in this, the college that I went to was such a place where God was, you know, the center of everything you did. I mean, we prayed in the dorms. It was not like normal colleges are, you know, this was really small college and everybody, we just prayed all the time together. We just always sought the Lord. And I come home for this Christmas break 
And I go to the store of my dad. This it's called the Jim store. It was, and I think they're gone now. It was in the Washington DC area. It was government employee membership. That's what it stood for. And I walked in there and my dad had to get some prescription or something and went over to the pharmacy counter. And there was this really pretty girl behind the counter. And she smiled at me, which was like, okay, I'm not used to that. So she smiled and I'm like smiling back. And she said, what's your name? And so I started talking to her and I mean, she started the conversation and this was really something I mean, she was very pretty. Okay. And so she asked me, Hey, can I stay around for a little bit? And she'd like to, I, I got a break coming up in like five minutes. Can you stay around? And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so after the break, we went over and went to Dunkin' Donuts, which was right over there and had some coffee and a donut and. And then she, you know, one thing led to another and, you know, I slipped away from God real quick and I left, I left Bible college. I didn't go back. She kept telling me, listen, you're going to make so much more money if you're doing this and doing that, you know, why do you want to be a preacher? And I'm like, well, oh, cause I love the Lord, but you can't tell somebody that that's right. not a Christian cause they don't get it. So she was like, you know, well, come on, I'll show you how to make more money and everything. And I slipped away from God completely. So we fast forward, you're a successful car salesman, you're living, uh, I'd be fair to call a wild party lifestyle, if you will, but you start having some weird health problems and, and you, you really don't do what you're supposed to do. No, I was burning a candle at both ends. <laughs> yeah, I was working like crazy, making really good money, plus dealing drugs on the side, making really good money. And I was a dancer. I mean, I used to love doing disco dancing. And so I, you know, I was always out there, I was in really physically fit shape. And so I'm out there on the dance floor. My leg just kept hurting. I ended up getting a blood clot. I didn't know it. I thought I had a, um, a Charlie horse or a sure. muscle cramp or whatever. Had no idea that's what it was. And I go to a doctor and this little, I remember he was a Polish doctor. I remember him looking at me and <laughs> I remember his accent. I can't imitate it, but I remember his accent. And he's like, what he said, he says, you have thromboinflobitis. Now I was 26 years of age at this time. All right. I had no idea what thrombone was. I thought it was something like trombone. And I thought maybe my leg was too short and needed to be stretched out, you know, like a trombone. Right, right. And so I wasn't really sure what it was, but yeah. And it was, he said, no, it's a blood clot. Cause I thought, well, what is this? You know, cause I had a blood clot and it was a serious blood clot, but I didn't take it serious. I just told him that's only for old people. Young people don't get that. So I just got down off of the table, you know, got dressed, got down off the table and got out of there and tried to live my life. I tried putting, elevating my leg. I tried icing it. I tried everything you can imagine nothing worked. So finally I end up in a hospital and the hospital is when I had no choice. Then the hospital put me in a hospital and they said, you can't move. I mean, they wouldn't even let me out of the bed to use the restroom. Nothing. I was done. So. And so I know you're in the hospital for a period of time. Uh, they end up sending you home. Uh, what happens when you go home? Well, the first thing I did was call up a girl because I played the sympathy <laughs> card, you know, wanted to have somebody over there to fix me something to eat. And you know, she was going to bring some alcohol or something and we're going to smoke some, I got plenty of drugs at home. So, you know, this is get home. I have, I've been straight for like 10 days and that was really hard. <laughs> so get there. First thing I had to do is light up a joint. Uh, she fixed something to eat, got something to eat. And then what's really strange is I, I just, I didn't feel right. Something felt really funny. And I just around nine o'clock at night, I just told her, I said, look, uh, listen, you can stay out here, watch TV. I, I, I got to go to bed or something wrong. I, I just need to go lay down. So I walked into the other room. And I lay down in my bed because that's just such an unusual thing for me. But that's the process that I went through. And it's right around nine o'clock. And I went in there, curled up on my left side because I had something called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy at the time. And you're supposed to sleep on your left because it helps the blood flow. And at least that's what they taught us. And so that's what I did. And lay down on the bed to fall asleep. Well, one of the really unique things about your story, I mean, I've, I've heard countless stories of people who have out of body experiences, uh, you know, when they die, they start floating above their body, but you actually got jerked or pulled out of your body. Tell us what that was like. That that's, I've only heard that in your story. Well, it, it was the, it was the strangest, weirdest thing. And I, it, it, the way this happened is I'm sleeping on my left side, my arms out just a little bit and something grabbed a hold of my left wrist so hard. And it jerked me around, you know, straightened me right up and pulled me right up out of the bed. It was this huge demon. And I can tell you that the demon had a hood over its head. Uh, you know, somebody tried to describe to me what it was for. And I learned that recently, but th this hood over the head and I could still see his face. And the thing was so strong and so powerful. Look, I, I tried to hit it. I tried to, now I was, like I said, I was in really good shape back then. And if I hit you, you know, you're going to go down. 
I hit this thing and it was like nothing. It was like, like it didn't even feel it. It didn't even affect it, you know? And I'm laying there and I'm sitting there. I'm trying to, you know, if you have a nightmare, what's the first thing you do? Turn the light switch on. Right. Once you turn the light on, <laughs> it it's going to go away. <laughs> so I reached over to turn the light on. My hand went through the wall. And I, at that point in time, I turned around and I looked and there I was laying in bed. And I, I sat there and I looked at myself and saw the clock you know, right above my head there. And I'm like, uh-oh, I'm dead. And I knew I was dead. And I knew this was a demon. And I knew where we were going. So did you rise towards the ceiling? Did you see a tunnel? A lot of people report either a dark tunnel or a tunnel of light. What, what was your kind of transition process like as you went from your bedroom into what you're going to experience next? I guess you could say it was a tunnel, but it was a very black tunnel, but there sure. was no light at the end of it. Okay, like a lot of people experience, there was no light. It was just going into a place that didn't smell good, sounded horrible. You know, the heat was strong, you know, very strong heat, just everything. It, it wasn't, wasn't a tunnel like, I mean, I guess it get, could be a tunnel. Sure. Because it was so black and surrounded so by there, darkness. You, you had a sense of movement, but it wasn't, it didn't feel or look like a tunnel per se. Not necessarily, no. But it was, a, we were moving. It probably <laughs> was some kind of tunnel, but we were just moving. It was dark. So this demon jerks you out of your body. There, you move in, in a place of darkness. What's the first thing you see on the other side? First thing I see on the other side is people. I see billions, millions, billions of people. And they're all just dangling there. And they're all just sitting there. You know, they can't do anything. And you start seeing these people. And, and, and as I went by each one of them, you know, I could look at every single one of them and know everything about them, their whole detail, their whole life. That's the thing that happens is when you're in the spirit, you don't have the flesh, you don't have your brain to get in the way. Right. So in the spirit, you just know everything. You just know all. And you can look at somebody and you just get it. You know everything about them. And so I'm seeing people. You know, that's the first thing I saw. Well, and a lot of our friends report having, in terms of communication or understanding, it's like a thought to thought or a spirit to spirit. Like you don't have to even talk. You just, you just instantly understand things. Absolutely. You just do. And they're looking at you. And even though they, their lips might not be moving, they're screaming, help me, help me. They're saying that to anybody, everybody, help me, help me. Cause they're, they're trapped and they know they're trapped forever. And I, I don't think you realize this at the time you would later in your journey, but as they're dangling, almost like they have kind of a, a ball and chain, they're, they're tethered, but they're stuck in this kind of dangling uh, space. That, that's actually their final resting place in hell. That is their final resting place. They're not going to go away from that. They're stuck there forever. That's the thing you have to realize, Sean. They're there forever. They're never going to get away from there. They're never going to move. You know, 100 million billion years is not even a second in eternity. It means nothing. That's how long you're there. I mean, you're just there forever. You're not going to get away. And the torture and the pain that you go through while you're in hell is unbelievable. And it's not something you can escape. In the flesh, we have a mechanism that the pain gets so severe, we pass out. Right. You don't have your flesh down there. <laughs> so when the pain gets severe, you just endure it and you get more pain. And you never get used to it. You just can't get used to the pain. It's, it's intense. You know, if you get a, you know what a splinter, a little tiny sure. splinter, how bad that hurts? Well, imagine that same pain from a little splinter throughout your whole body. Because that's what it feels like. And I know we've talked to, uh, no, on a number of other occasions, and you've talked about just this complete, un utter feeling of hopelessness. Like once you cross from your bedroom into hell, like did that hopelessness hit you instantly? It hit me before I left the bedroom. All of a sudden, you knew there wasn't any hope. But the more I started going into hell, the more hopeless I realized it was. Like the, once, like the weight of it got worse and uh, worse. It's the heaviest burden you could ever imagine because then you know it's done. I mean, you could cry out to God all you want. You're done. You're toast, so to speak. And, you know, you're not going to get out of that. You're never going to go anywhere. There's no hope. And I've explained this before. If you jumped out of a perfectly good airplane at 15,000 feet above the earth, and the only place you can land on earth, it's just covered with concrete and rock, and you're going to land on your head without a parachute, you're just going to jump out of a plane, and come down and hit the concrete or hit the rock with the top of your head, you have more hope that you're just going to get up, walk away from that, just like nothing ever happened, no scratch, no bumps, no anything, than you do in hell. And in terms of the, the journey, I mean, eventually you get to a place where a demon's about to put you in your final resting place. What were some of the things you saw along the way as you're getting taken deeper into hell? Well, I started seeing... 
other people, people that I did recognize, you know, from different places. I saw preachers. I saw evangelists that I remember seeing. You know, I saw different people like this. I'm not going to name names for a lot sure. of reasons. Sure. But I saw these people in hell. I saw other people in hell that I knew. Um, the thing was, is I'm watching the demons as the demons were doing things to people. And then I was able to see Lucifer. And I saw him as well. So, and it's not when you look at him, it's not what you think. You're not going to see somebody with horns and a tail or anything. I saw the most beautiful creature I had ever seen in my life. I saw somebody that once you looked at him, you're like in awe and you're like, wow. You know, you want to be like that in your mind, as terrible as it sounds, here I am in hell. I'm thinking, boy, I wish I could look like that. I wish I could be like that. It was just something about it, you know. It was very powerful when you saw it. And I'm in hell, and I'm looking at this, and I'm realizing that's him. That's Lucifer. That's Satan. That's the one that tricks and fools everybody. Now I understand why he fools you. Now I understand why he, he tricks you up. He's not that evil-looking thing that some of his demons are. He's beautiful. He's, wow, unbelievable. And I shared this in some of our earlier conversations, but that's one thing that's always stuck with me from your story because I've heard many different people give accounts who were part of witches' covens and satanic worship and different things, and they will talk about encountering Satan manifesting through a person or Lucifer manifesting through a person, and they often will describe this Romanian prince who is just the most beautiful, alluring, whatever all, whatever words you want to uh, use to describe it, just a beautiful, beautiful being that you were drawn to. And so that that has always stuck with me because it what you saw uh, kind of on the other side of the veil, if you will, you know, we've had people kind of report here in, in a situation that's kind of a crossing between the, the natural and the supernatural. Um, in terms of having like your, your wits, your mental faculties about you, um, like, you know, are, are you just as conscious? I mean, I, f- I feel like your senses are probably even dialed up more, but are you just as conscious uh, on the other side as you were here on earth? More so. You're actually alive. I mean, when I say alive, I mean, everything about you, every fiber of your being is so alive and so aware of everything. Because when you're there, you don't just have your regular senses. You have more senses than you've ever dreamed of. I mean, you hear anything you hear actually goes through your body, goes through your spirit. You don't just hear it in your ears. You hear it through your whole being. So if you feel something, you feel it through the whole being. Like if you touch something, your whole being feels that, not just that where the touch is. So when you hear something, it's the same way. So when I'm hearing people scream, it's coming through my whole body. Everything is coming through there. You hear it. You recognize it. It, it, um, your, your senses are so heightened. I mean, you just know everything. I, I don't know how to explain it. You make Google and Siri look like they're, you know, kindergarten <laughs> stuff, you know, you just know that much. Well, and many of our friends report when they are at the start of their out of body experience, they've died, they've come out of their body that they feel a, a feeling of release or a, a, a kind of the, the weightiness of their sickness, whatever it was like that's left. For you, you were entering into a hell experience. When you came out of your body, did you feel the weight of that sickness lifted off you, or was it all, you were automatically in a, a very icky kind of negative place? I, I was in such an icky place so fast. I never thought about that, you know, just to be blunt. I never did. never crossed my mind. I don't remember having a problem. Sure. I just remember this demon taking me. I felt like I was in pretty good shape, you know. That's what I thought, <laughs> you know, because I was trying to hit this thing. I didn't think of my heart. I didn't think of. You know, I didn't think of the pain in my leg, didn't think of anything, you know. I just wanted to get this demon off of me. And so I guess my spiritual adrenaline was flowing. <laughs> <laughs> so you're being taken to what what you thought was gonna be your your final resting place. Um, like how did how did you like how did you know that? And um like what was happening to you as you're kind of getting kind of to be put in that suspended kind of space, just like you saw these other people as you've been going throughout hell. Well, the demon was talking to me the whole time. He was laughing at me. He was making fun of me. You know, hey, Mr. Goody Two Shoes, hey, you know, you really blew it, buddy. You fell for our trap, you know. You And the trap was the girl. Sure. And then the next trap was the drugs, you know, and then the party life and all those things. I just fell for all these traps. And it's funny because it didn't just pop up. It wasn't like some evil thing came up. It came in the form of something very sweet and very nice, very beautiful. Sure. You know, that's how that trap, you know, I fell for that trap. Not unlike how you described Lucifer. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's how the trap happened. And so I, I fell for that. And so while this demon's taking me there, I'm running all that through. I mean, I'm, I'm realizing that 
Those are the reasons why I messed up. And this demon's going to take me. Now, this demon's laughing, and it's telling me, and, it's go, and it says, here's your place. So I know it's not in English. It's kind of hard to explain it, but I know that's what sure. you meant. This is my place. This is where I'm going to be, just like all the other people. And there's a place for you. Trust me. There is a place for you in hell if you don't give your life to the Lord, and it's waiting for you. And it's there forever, and it's never going to go away. You know, as long as you're alive on earth, and once you die, you go there. You're done forever unless you give your life to the Lord ahead of time. But I know he was getting ready to take me and put me there. It was like he was just going to grab me. He had a hold of my wrist the whole time, but now he's starting to grab a hold of me to turn me around and put me in there. That's how I knew. And obviously something changed because you're back and we're having this conversation. So uh, what's the process of, of getting out of that place? You were about to enter in your place of eternal torment. What changed? What shifted the situation? Well, this is what happened. As this demon was ready to turn me around and put me into my place, a voice rang out, and the voice said, you must let him go. It's not his time. I made a promise to his mother. Instantly, this, this demonic being that had a hold of me, that I couldn't do anything to, that was laughing, that had all the power, and I just want to pause for a second, mm -hmm. all the power in the world that you could ever imagine, these demons had every power over you. Once you're in hell, they have everything over you. You can't fight them. You can't resist them. You can't do anything. They own you. And they knew they had me. And there was nothing that could shake them. But once that voice rang out, this big demon shook, shuddered. He was like, and cowered down. You could see the actual coward-looking moment as he let go of me. That's exactly what happened. And in terms of that voice, who, who was it? Who did you under, did, did you know who it was? Was it the Father? Was it Jesus? Who was who was calling out and interceding on your behalf? It was God. It was God himself. Because my mother believed that God, you know, had always told her that none of her children would ever go to hell. She said, it's in the Bible. God made me a promise. That's what's going to happen. Now, my mother prayed for me about two, three, four, sometimes five <laughs> times a day. Okay, so I needed it. I was ADHD. Okay, I moved around a little bit. <laughs> I couldn't sit still. I still have that problem today. But, uh, you know, so she prayed for me all the time. At that time, it was over 22,000 prayers for me. Wow. So this demon, you know, that had everything, then the voice of God rang out and said, it's not his time, which it wasn't my time. I shouldn't have been dying that young. It wasn't my time. And he made a promise to my mother. Their promise was made through the prayers. My mom, it, I mean, listen, if somebody came to you 22,000 times, would you eventually say, okay, we'll take care of this? <laughs> yeah. You know. Yeah. Yes. It's like the woman always bothering the king. I need this. I need yes, this. I need yes. this. Um, when, when you, when you preach and you minister, I know you share your story. Um, what, what is your challenge to parents about the importance of prayer? I, I think it's funny because with many of our friends who've shared their stories, it's always their mother <laughs> that seems to be the one who's been interceding yeah. and praying. So dads, I think we need to step it up. We need to be featured in some of these, uh, near death experience and heaven stories. But, um, based on, on your experience, like, and what you share when you preach, like how important is it for parents to be praying and interceding for their children every single day? Look, that's one of the most important things you can do. Not only that, listen, you just pray every day. I, I plead the blood of Jesus over my, my son. I mean, I, it's something you do. I just pray that every parent understands this is so important for you to pray for your children. Never stop, never give up, no matter what the circumstances are, no matter what it looks like. Look, I had been a really good Christian kid, and my mother knew I was on the far end of the spectrum at that time. And I'm sure she was probably praying 10 times a day. I don't know. <laughs> She's praying for me constantly, even though... You know, people would sit there and say, well, you know, he's this, he's that. My mother kept saying, it doesn't matter. I'm going to pray for him anyways. And she kept praying for me, praying for me, praying for me. And this is what happened. Now, at, this is the way I look at it. Every place I go, every time I speak, any lives to get changed, any guy, lives to get changed from reading my book, lives to get changed from anything, from watching this, anything, my mother gets credit for that. That's the way I look at it. Because if it wasn't for her prayers, no telling where I'd be. It's so, and I want to get on this just in another moment. Parents never, ever, ever stop. Never stop. And children, if you have parents that are unsaved, never stop praying for your parents. I have a sister that is now, well, she's 72. She'll shoot me if she hears this. <laughs> so she's 72. I'm almost 73. And she didn't give her heart to the Lord until two years ago. So think about that. And she didn't die. Now, my one sister did pass away. She had given her life to the Lord too. So it's just like 
everybody. They're coming back. They're not going away. Never stop praying for your children. You just don't know what's going to happen. You don't know. Yeah, I think for me with these heaven stories, just the answered prayers, uh, that, that just gives me great faith for interceding and why intercession, uh, even when things seem hopeless, uh, it's, it's just all the more important. Uh, and so that, that transition point, the demon's trying to drag you down into your final place of torment. The voice of God rings out. Do you see a light? Is there a tunnel? Like, how, how do you get, get transitioned out of hell into heaven? Well, as soon as that was said, the demon, when the demon let go of me, I mean, I watched him cower down and let go of me. As soon as he did, you know, all of a sudden I'm like, I mean, I, it, the movement was so fast. Yeah, I saw a light, but I didn't see it for maybe the first tenth of a second. I don't know, okay. so fast. So it was fast. But it was a boom, and all of a sudden I see the light, and then I'm there, and I'm right at the gates of heaven. And it is bright, and it is light. <laughs> There's no shadows up there, none whatsoever. And uh, give us, uh, it's almost time for us to wrap up, and we, we're going to get into your heaven story uh, in the next episode. But in terms of uh, the gates of heaven, what did that look like? What did you see? Well, I, I think the word we finally came up with was pearlescent. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just so shiny, so different, and it changes colors, and it moves as the light glistens and moves across it. It just keeps changing in the colors, and it's so beautiful. And it's like pearl. It's like a mother of pearl or pearl itself. It's so pure and beautiful. It's not like something we have here. It, even a pearl can't describe it. Even a mother of pearl can't describe it. It's just that gorgeous, that beautiful. The gate is, it's almost like a living gate. Oh. <laughs> that would be a good way to put it. Well, and, and, and that's really intriguing that you describe it that way. Because again, so many of the encounters we've talked about uh, over the last year, people describe everything as living in heaven and emanating light and like everything's alive in a way that's just uh, um, markedly different from what we experience down here on earth. Uh, in terms of being at the gate, were there other people there? Were there angels there? Do, do you encounter any people kind of at that entry point or kind of transitory spot? Well, I was greeted by an angel. The angel was standing off to the side of the gate, off to the right-hand side of the gate. And the angel, th this is a huge angel. I mean, <laughs> I say, you know, seven feet, could have been 10 feet. I don't know. He was huge. But, uh, and I say he, because it looked like a guy. Sure. So, and he reached out his hand and told me I had to take his hand. And he spoke to me about that. And it was very unique, but his voice, the power behind it, everything was just unbelievable. But yeah, that's, it was greeted by an angel, just one angel. It was all I saw. And, and in terms of you describe hearing a voice that, that thought to thought, that spirit to spirit communication, even though mouths aren't moving, you're actually hearing, just like we're talking now, it's a voice with inflection and tone and sound. That's the way you hear it. <laughs> You, you hear it like that. I, we talk about speaking, and anybody that's been through that, they're going to tell you the same thing. You don't see their lips moving, but you hear them. Right. You hear the power behind their voice. You hear what it sounds like. I, I mean, there were some times I saw lips moving, too, when they were talking, but you don't need that. You know, it's just you just have that ability, that communication ability. And it, it's unreal. It's an unusual communication. Well, audience, we're going to leave you hanging right there. Uh, we have a lot more to cover from Ivan's Heaven Experience. So come back and join us next week for Engaging the Supernatural.